This week, we welcome special guest Apollo Clark in studio. In the enterprise security news, Microsoft buys another company. To pet you or not to pet you, lock down your Linux, managing the sharing. It only takes one. To patch or not. Our topic this week, we will cover the enterprise security considerations for Docker implementations. Then we get geeky with it on our technical segment on Enterprise Security Weekly, managing AWS cloud resources. All that and more on this episode of Enterprise Security Weekly. This is Security Weekly, for security professionals, by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where we talk security vendors and aren't afraid to name names. It's Enterprise Security Week. Was, uh, the teleprompter now has artificial intelligence, Doug, and updates itself. It's awesome. <laughs> uh, uh, this week, and talk about them as it relates to enterprise security, you're going to do great. <laughs> We're gonna, we're gonna, yeah. I, I think that people think that you and I talk like every day at night. You know, yeah. it's like, hey, what are you doing? It's kind of a bit of an exhausting week. And I think that we noticed that a little bit in the uh, stories for this week as well. Logarithms Netmon Freemium delivers real-time network visibility to quickly identify emerging threats in your IT environment. Netmon Freemium is a free commercial-grade network forensics and traffic analytics solution. You can use Netmon Freemium's powerful capabilities to search against all observed network traffic, identify abnormal traffic patterns and application usage, and quickly analyze full packet captures. Take the first step towards real-time network visibility. Visit logarithm.com forward slash freemium to learn more and download it today. Are you worried about PCI compliance? Does your development team understand or care about security? Are you ready to face a breach of your customer's sensitive data? See the worst that can happen before it does. Black Hills Information Security can help you help management see the future. Email consulting at blackhillsinfosec.com to find out how a web application penetration test can mitigate the risk before you go live. IT Pro TV, an easy, entertaining approach to online IT training. Stream over 2,000 hours of up-to-date, high-quality video content live and on demand. Premium annual memberships include all video content as well as access to virtual labs and the Q&A forums. You'd pay $85.70 a month or $857 per year, but we have a special offer for our listeners. For a free 7-day trial and 30% off the lifetime of your active subscription, visit itpro.tv forward slash enterprise security and use the code ES30. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 51 of Enterprise Security Weekly. I'm your host, Paul Asadorian. Before I get into it, I'm going to get the announcement in because IT Pro TV is awesome. Their courses now include Computer Hacking Forensic Investigator V9, Kali Linux, CompTIA A plus 901, and Accelerated CompTIA A. Security Plus. Premium annual memberships include all video content as well as access to virtual labs and the Q&A forums. For a limited time, get 30% off a monthly membership for the lifetime of your active subscription by visiting itpro.tv forward slash enterprise security and using the discount code ES30. I am so excited to be here on this like new fangled set I, I had the, the guys create uh, for us. Apollo Clark is here with us. Apollo, welcome. Thanks for having me. And uh, it's nice to have you back in studio. It's been a while. We caught up at B-Sides Boston, of course. Uh, you gifted us some rum, which we drank, all, like, the whole bottle. It was awesome. <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, and you're making cocktails here, which are just... Dude, I don't know. Like, when I make a cocktail and when you make a cocktail, there's still... Like, I'm somewhere, like, down here, and you're still, like, way up here, dude. Like, it tastes fantastic. It's about the love. It's, it's all, I guess that's it. I'm lacking some of the love for the cocktail. We got the cocktail smoker. I want to make sure we, we got to experiment with that it's gonna uh, be fun. later for, maybe for Paul Security Weekly. Um, this show is jam-packed. I'm excited. Um, you are doing a technical segment, right? I had that in there. We didn't yes. really. Okay. So you have a technical segment on managing AWS cloud resources. We're going to talk about Docker security in the enterprise. We're probably just going to scratch the surface. I have a lot of, uh, we were talking before the show. Actually, Apollo helped us out with, now our listeners know the name PP Works. I get emails now. Paul, how's your PP working? <laughs> 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 Paul, I heard your PP's working. So uh, the cat's out of the bag. Uh, Apollo has helped us with that, actually laid the foundation for when I, I put it into Docker to learn how it worked. So I've got some questions about how that translates to enterprise considerations for Docker, mm -hmm. um, which is going to be a fun conversation. Certainly 
the start of just a series of conversations I think we're going to be having. I know you said there's still people that are split on what technology to use. Yeah. I still think Docker is going to be at the core, dude. So it's something we need to talk about. Mm -hmm. So I love that I can actually be across the table from you uh, and talk. So um, what have you been up to lately, dude? Did you, you were an independent contractor for a while. Yep. Uh, now yeah. you have a full-time gig. Is that still, still true? Uh, for now, uh, working with uh, Aquia. <laughs> so, yeah, it's good. That's good. That's good. I like I like how you always uh, manage to keep yourself entertained uh, with various jobs and, and positions. So trying to, yep. Um, it's good. I'm I'm excited to talk with you about uh, AWS and Docker uh, and things like that. You bring a different aspect, as that's been your focus for quite some time. Where I'm just a security guy that's trying to hack together some, you know, <laughs> Docker containers and AW. We don't even use AWS uh, primarily as our our hosting provider. Mm. So um, probably need to make the switch. So, enterprise security news. This is the segment where we talk about the enterprise security news, uh, things that are happening in enterprise security uh, this week. Microsoft uh, confirms it's buying an Israeli cloud monitoring startup, Cloud Clouddine, Cloud Dine, Cloud Dine, Cloud Dine, Cloud Dine, Cloud Dine, Cloud Y N. I'm calling it Cloud Dine because it's pronounced Dine when you say Dine. Right, like that's the, the Dine people. Yeah. 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 Uh, so Cloud Dine will be incorporated into Microsoft's product portfolio, offering customers the in uh, the industry's broadest set of multi-cloud management, security, and governance solutions. I thought it was very interesting for Microsoft, and I don't know if you played with Azure or any of the Microsoft cloud mm -hmm. solutions, but they're like stepping outside of Azure and offering security management solutions outside of their own cloud platform, which I thought that was kind of an interesting play. I'm honestly not too surprised by it. I, last time I used Azure was about a year ago. Mm -hmm. um, at the time, you know, I was building some, I usually always say AMIs because I'm used to Amazon, yeah. but, uh, you know, some virtual images with uh, Kai Linux and how to deploy that. Mm -hmm. um, at the time, at least a year ago, Azure has a lot of the same base resources you'd find in Amazon. So you have... I'm trying to not use Amazon terminology here. Yeah. You have virtual images, you have load balancers, um, you have static IPs you can use and reuse mm -hmm. for different resources. Um, it has things like hosted databases, hosted memory caches, and things like that. Overall, I tried using it when I was on my Ubuntu machine mm -hmm. and using the um, the Azure CLI. It didn't work very well. I gotcha. <laughs> go, I gotcha. go figure. Yeah. I jumped over to my Windows 7 side. Worked beautifully. Worked beautifully, yeah. So as long, at least at the time a year ago, um, this is right before they released Windows uh, 10 and everything with the mm -hmm. uh, Ubuntu bash. Yeah. Yeah. So things may have changed since then. Mm -hmm. um, I would say it doesn't have as many resources as Amazon, to be fair. That's fine. Um, the configurations, for the most part, are pretty much on par with each other. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't necessarily call it a drop-in replacement. So given that, and uh, Satya, I'm probably going to butcher his last name, Nadia, He's the, uh, the CEO, the of, CEO Microsoft. of Microsoft, yeah. Yeah, I think Microsoft has realized they need to integrate with Linux. Mm -hmm. um, what's ironic is I have a few friends who work at Microsoft, actually, in the mm -hmm. data science department. Um, they all use Linux. Oh, that's so Microsoft does use Linux internally. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think it's interesting, too, that your strategy for, for being in the cloud like that, you're probably, given the limitations, mm. you're probably going to take your Linux environment and use Amazon and you're probably going to take your Windows environment and use Azure. So. Exactly, yeah. And I, but I think that's similar to the way enterprises approach operating systems today. The desktops mm -hmm. are running Windows. You might have a Linux you know, farm for this, and whatever app server or web service you're using are built on top of whichever platform. Yeah. So I, I think it's it's the, like the same but different with cloud is really the, the mantra, right? I think their strategy is mostly to say, you know, we already know you're using Amazon. Like yeah. That's probably a fact for a large enterprise. You know, we're going to give you a really easy adoption path so that way you're not all in on Azure and having to totally replace what you have. I think that's the strategy they're going for. Yeah. I just think it's, I find it's pretty amazing what Amazon has done to displace larger players like Cisco, yeah. like uh, Google <laughs> and Microsoft and really just have that cloud platform that changed so many things. You know, I give credit to... Azure and Amazon, I've really thought about this the past couple of years, is what made Amazon uh, the real key player. Um, I think a lot of it was they'd put really good documentation online. Yep. Um, they did really good with creating, I mean, I've been using it since 2010. You mm -hmm. know, it came out in 20, 2009, 2008. They were the, the, the leader in that space, yeah. really. Yeah. You know, they were the ones that made it really easy. Again, Cisco and those guys, they all focused on on-prem. 
Mm -hmm. And that was the bread and butter for them. So, of course, they did that. They didn't really see the rise of the ease of using cloud resources. So the barrier to entry for things like Cisco was saying, you know, you must sign a 100000 more like a million-dollar contract, mm -hmm. then you can start playing with us. Amazon said, no, you can be a small dev like myself, and you can go ahead and just... Get stuff for free. Yeah, like, they'll give it to you for free. At the, even back then, too, it was very cheap. You know, I was paying, like, yeah. $20 for a small little uh, EC2 instance. It was great. Yep. Twenty dollars a month or per year? A month. Okay. So you're still paying a little bit of money, but still, yeah. even then, you know, back in this time, I was using uh, Rackspace actually, yep. and even then, the prices were competitive. Yeah. For uh, Amazon resources, they've gone up. A I, little like bit. I like Linode. I like Linode. We actually switched Linode. from Rackspace to Linode, um, nice. and then I, I think Digital Ocean's really on the lower end of basically hosting your platform, mm. uh, platform as a service. Um, Amazon is is interesting because of their cost models. I think that's where I think Amazon hurt themselves. Where yeah. I think Microsoft's going to have the win, especially that they're buying up companies to complete their portfolio in terms of security. Mm -hmm. They're going to have a win because I'm going to people are taking their Windows environments and they're going to move them into Azure. Oh, absolutely. You think about it too, um, you look at the AWS Linux AMI instances, mm -hmm. um, those are built in-house at Amazon and they're optimized for their hypervisor. Right. Um, under the covers, the hypervisor that Amazon uses is actually Zen. Yeah. Um, granted, it's a highly customized version of it. Yeah. So you can't really say it's just Zen. It's actually it's like... Amazon Zen. Yeah. Amazon Zen, effectively. Um, the point is they heavily optimize that, they have heavily optimized for Linux. But you think about it in terms of, of that context, uh, Microsoft guaranteed is optimizing their hypervisor. They're probably using Hyper-V or some variation of it mm -hmm. um, to optimize for Windows instances, which, again, I don't think Amazon could optimize as well as Microsoft could, That's a great given point. the in-house expertise. Yeah. Um, Carbon Black has analyzed the... Have you read about the Petya, not Petya ransomware? I've read about it here and there. Just uh, It's... <laughs> There's a lot it's going ransomware. On. There's a lot I mean, going on with that thing. I, I put it in there because it does. Uh, it landed on every security, or not every, but most security vendors' mm. blog pages that they're all covering it. Um, some vendors actually responded with messages in blog posts like, hey, we're not sounding all the alarms. Yeah. Uh, it was highly targeted uh, in Europe. It impacted uh, industries such as M Maersk, M Maersk, Maersk, the world's largest container Shipping company, which is kind of ironic oh, that yeah, we're yeah. talking Maersk, about. Maersk. I know what you're talking about. Yeah, <laughs> we're yeah, talking yeah. about containers. M e r s k. They're a container company, but not like Docker physical container. Containers. They're physical, physical container containers. company. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it appears to be the exploitation of Ukrainian tax software called Medoc or Medoc, Medoc. Anyway, the sample also spreads on the internal network via exploitation of Eternal Blue SMB vulnerability, uh, PS Exec, WMI, and admin shares. Yeah, again, the more conspiracy theory part of this, which may not even be a conspiracy theory at this point, is that it's just basically Russia just seeing what they can do. It, it, and, and it's maybe, maybe not. I think from an enterprise security perspective, it's interesting. You, I mean, your strategy has to be pretty rock solid to protect against this stuff. Yeah. If you're not doing the due diligence to protect against this type of threat, right? So, and it's not just protecting against the malware itself. There's a whole strategy i mean from the first initial entry point into your network which is typically phishing mm -hmm. that goes to the malware or the loader being installed on the system detecting the injection detecting the payload like there's so many different points in this i hate to use the term kill chain yeah. but points in this you know uh series of uh smaller attacks that basically lead to ransomware you got to have all those protections. And I mean, that's yeah. really the heart and soul of the show is to help people figure out what to do in each of those cases. And I, I don't, I don't like to, uh, like make a document that says, well, you just need to have these things, right? It differs per right. organization. It changes over time. It depends on what you're defending. It depends on what technologies you have. It depends on your internal team, right? Mm -hmm. But you have to be able to look at the ransomware that's going around today and look at the 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 whole chain of uh, events that led to a system being encrypted and say i got to stop it or slow it down at different points in its lifespan on your network right yeah. so i mean spreading through admin shares and things like that there's just so many ways in which i think you can block uh, this particular stuff so yeah, I mean, in the context of enterprise, one of the things I find so disheartening, and InfoSec Twitter's been pretty good about you know pushing <coughs> back on this, is saying, oh, you guys should have patched three, four months ago when the thing first came out. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's really not that easy. You and I have worked in large enterprise systems. I have you a know. story about that, actually. Oh, it's funny you, you mentioned that. Um, Duo Security actually uh, put out an opinion piece 
on four reasons why organizations can't just patch. I saw that. I haven't read that one yet. So what'd they say? It's pretty good. Um, so their first one is if the system isn't under your control, you can't update it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> this was something I worked at university around the time when all the Microsoft worms were coming out. Yep. And do this hit me hard, right? Like their students mm -hmm. were kind of like an ISP for the students and I don't have control of the system. However, they're an infection point for the rest of the entire network. Yeah. So your strategy has to be twofold, right? You have to help the people who are vulnerable, whose systems you don't have control over. Yeah. And you have to harden what you do have control over and protect it from the students, right? So it's funny. My girlfriend went to uh, Lincoming University mm -hmm. uh, about six years ago. I was really impressed by that is they actually gave her free, I think it was Nod ESET antivirus. Yeah. Yeah, they gave it to him for free. And I'm like, that's an awesome step in the right direction. It is. I, a, I have another story about AV and how he's <laughs> bypassed, uh, which is part of my concern. Uh, and we've had whole segments on endpoint protection and how mm -hmm. kind of uh, traditional antivirus, as is pointed out by a study that we'll talk about later, um, not very effective. Some of the newer endpoint is very effective. However, on an enterprise scale, it's difficult to rip and replace. There's costs associated with that. Yeah. Um, Cold so crush? much. We're going to be talking with Endgame, actually. Uh, I had a, a call with them. They're going to be coming on Paul Security Weekly uh, and talking about some of the <coughs> detection methods they use for malware and some of the things that they're seeing. Nice. So I think that's really going to shed some light on the endpoint side of things uh, as well. But if the system's under your control, you can't necessarily... You can give people antivirus, but you don't have control over it. Mm. So you can't enforce... A lot of the endpoint protection that exists today, and, and John's been a huge proponent of this, it's all about the configuration and Absolutely. the settings in it. So if you can't control those, you can't update it. Um, they say it's especially bad in organizations below the security poverty line, which... I've never heard that concept before, but I, yeah, I think I kind of what you're talking about. It's an interesting concept. Um, yeah. But it, they say it applies as much to <laughs> financial training in banks as it does to networks run by centralized higher education systems. Yeah. Um, voiding the warranty in licensing terms by doing your own patching is not an option. In other words, if I've got an app and it works on Windows XP and I update it to the latest operating system, I violate the warranty, that's just not an option. So pointing out the problem, it's a difficult problem to address. Yeah. Uh, I think that the security vendor landscape can do a better job of helping companies stuck in that legacy operating system um, situation. I think that uh, a couple of different uh, pieces of content we've run recently in the network address that. One, Javelin Networks is awesome at detecting Active Directory security issues and attacks. Um, they have uh, mentioned that they're going to uh, they're working on supporting legacy operating systems. It's something that uh, I believe is on their radar. How far back they'll go, I'm not I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, but you know, because obviously that's a moving a moving curve. Mm. Um, and um, Justin, Justin Henderson, I think was his name, came on and talked about logging. Mm -hmm. And basically doing very similar things to what Javelin was doing within the network, but being able to identify those in logs, which is still valid even if your operating system is legacy, and being able to detect the attack yeah. uh, and even prevent it uh, with some group policy settings is interesting. So Nice. Can uh, I talk about the difficulty of uh, upgrading? Yes. Yeah, so one of the things that a lot of people don't really understand or appreciate, unless they've really worked in large-scale networks, we're talking... Um, 100,000. I wouldn't yeah. say it's like 100,000, but even around at least 1,000 mm -hmm. to 10,000 or more. Once you reach that scale, um, you know, you're working in a large group of people, multiple departments, and just having that level of coordination is uh, really difficult. You know, because you have this department over here running this service, this department over here, but you're all affected by the same vulnerabilities. So one, just getting that cross-department uh, coordination is difficult. And on top of that, too, you can't just upgrade. You know, I mostly do Linux servers, but I can mm. upgrade an entire fleet of servers with a single command. Yeah. Sudo apt-get upgrade. That's all it would take. Mm -hmm. the, the act of upgrading is easy. It's making sure dash that... Dash Y. Dash Y. Dash Y. To, <laughs> to auto, auto say yes. Yep. That's how you automate it. Um, but it's hard because there's so many other layers on top of these given vulnerabilities. You know, you can say, well, don't, why don't you just upgrade you know, SMB and Active Directory? It's not that easy because... They're using so many other software packages on top of that, and some of those software packages may not support the newer version. Mm -hmm. Therefore, you break functionality. So you can argue that, yeah, we upgraded, but we broke you know, the business mm -hmm. in the process. And that's something that takes you know, weeks, more oftentimes months, to you know, have a 
development team, a QA team, go through, do the upgrade on a test environment. Regression test. Do the regression test, make sure nothing breaks, and then, you know, rolling it out. The difficulty of rolling things out for enterprise, you don't just press one button and go. No. You have to actually, particularly if you have customers using the infrastructure, you know, you have to say, okay, just so you know, we're putting you in a maintenance window, and we have to coordinate with someone in Australia, someone in China, someone in Europe, so that way we can coordinate your part of the infrastructure getting upgraded during a given downtime of your business. It's a, it's a great point. It goes back to our conversation we are talking about earlier about the complexities of upgrading an application. Yeah. And any app, I mean, we were talking about in a Docker context, but wherever your application lives, right, the right way to do things is you make a change in development. That's my patch that this code will now work with the upgraded platform that it's running on. Whatever yeah. that is, it could be the app server, it could be the operating system, it could be both. I make that change in development. I have to regression test exactly. my entire application if I'm being diligent about it, of course, right? Yep. I have to do my unit testing. I have to push that into QA. I have to go through all the different testing we were talking about, right? Test yep. functionality, test different use cases, do maybe fuzz test, like did it break something in the app? Yeah. Once I've done that, then I had to push that out into production. I have to do all that first before I can then go upgrade my app server. Absolutely. And so the thing that I would love, just because I'm a developer, you know, it's my background, and I think of what would it, what would be the ideal scenario in a fancy, fantasy, you know, fairy tale world, it would be I would get a piece of software from a vendor and I would get the functional tests. Yeah. They're never going to give you the functional tests. Right. That's the you know, internal proprietary stuff. But that yeah. would be the ideal saying, here's a given software that you're using as part of your environment and we'll give you all the functional tests that you can run to make sure things work. So that way, when you do your self-service upgrades, mm -hmm. that's really what they are, yep. you can test whether or not the upgrades work. Because what ends up happening is if you don't have those, it's all done manually. Oh, that's a great point. I never thought about it that way. Yeah. That is that is great. I so, wish it would. <clears throat> it's hard. I have seen some hard. software vendors do that in the past really? in my... I want to say I've run across that where they will give very rarely. Yeah. Usually when software is running end of life, maybe. Yeah. It would the be other, more likely. Oh, that's another problem too. You know, sometimes you cannot upgrade. Sometimes you have a piece of software that is just so old. Mm -hmm. You know, your your version four came up. You're still on version three, or so, you know, God forbid, version two. Mm -hmm. And you know, having getting the political will—that's really what it comes down to—is the people problem. Unfortunately, getting the will to say we need to go and upgrade this thing from version well, two. And to that's four. the point that Duo makes next: is organizational constraints, particularly in the yeah. public sector. Like yep. they point out, taxpayers aren't going to pay to update hardware and software that are working just fine. They treat it like toasters. Yeah. Yeah. Built to last directly conflicts with update early and often. Exactly. <laughs> And that's the problem, too. What happens if you're running a piece of software that's mission critical, core to your, to your business or your environment, and there is no upgrade path for that? Mm -hmm. You know, the vendor itself says, doesn't say anything. You call them up the next day and say, do you support the new version of Active Directory because we need to patch for Eternal Blue? And they say, we'll get back to you. I've heard that happen. Mm. That's not good. Any system with external highly entangled dependencies will take longer to update. We addressed that yep. already. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Integration testing certifications is exactly what we were just mm -hmm. uh, discussing. So um, uh, other news in the stories. Um, uh, this is interesting. It, you and I are both more on the Linux side of the house than the right. Windows uh, side of the house. They say, um, who was it that did the study? WatchGuard said that in their research, because uh, they have all those uh, appliance-based firewalls that are collecting uh, threat intelligence, essentially, okay. and they distill it down to a, port, a, lot, a report. A lot of vendors do this. Mm. They say there is an increased presence of people targeting Linux and web servers. So Linux exploit, Linux download, or Linux flutter combined to illustrate attackers focus on Linux servers and IoT devices. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, personally, I'm biased on this one grossly. Mm. I do think Linux is more secure than Windows, but not by much, honestly. Mm. I just think a little bit more, um, just because the source code is public. Because I think, I would argue that Linux isn't more inherently architecturally more secure than Windows, because Windows has done an amazing work over mm -hmm. the past, um, oh, wow, almost about, when was that, that memo that Bill Gates put out? Yep. I think it was like 2005, 2006. Yeah, we interviewed the guy that yeah. was behind the yeah, line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a turning point for Microsoft. They really got their act together and they mm -hmm. kept it together. So architecturally, I'd say Windows and Linux, again, you can say whatever you want about it, but I think they're about on par. But I would argue that Linux is able to respond more quickly and more efficiently because the source code is available. Therefore, they effectively have the public internet of engineers that can go in and make the fixes quicker and release it quicker. I would argue. Yeah, that. I, I don't know. Microsoft has a large number of engineers, and I think they're pretty quick to come up with a, a fix. I think the yeah. 
<clears throat> the difference is Microsoft has to support legacy technologies more so than Linux does. That's true. Yeah, that's the thing. I uh, think that gives Linux the advantage in your scenario. Right. Is the fact that there's not, I mean, there are paying customers to Red Hat and different organizations, mm. but for a large part, like if you're using Debian, if you're using anyway, hey, you're like, yeah, we're going to make this change. Like, we don't have to answer to gov large governments of a, an entire country that go, well, if you change that, like, it's going to break all our stuff. Now, what are you going to do? They yeah. don't, Linux doesn't have those inherent political issues that go along with their software. Yeah, so. back in April, uh, Ubuntu, uh, end of life, to Ubuntu 12, mm -hmm. which I can't remember when that came. I think it was like 2010. Mm. Um, but yeah, they just said, nope, that is it. We are cutting it off. Yep. Just boom, gone. Microsoft wouldn't do that. Yeah. They, they still, to this day, support certain customers on XP. They pay for it. Exactly. Yeah. But they do, they do that legacy support. So yep. um, legacy antivirus continues to miss new malware. And this is something that is just a continuing trend. Yeah. Uh, there's so many ways to, to bypass. Like oh, I said, absolutely. I was just meeting with the end game engineers. And I was like, there's so many ways around. Yeah. The different protections um it's it's ridiculous and carbon black had a nice write-up too about how the petia uh malware gets in the system and, and does its thing so uh we'll talk in paul security weekly in upcoming episodes on fileless malware mm. which it turns out it's not really truly 100 percent fileless it's kind of just an yeah. overarching there's different ways to be you have fileless. to have some form of persistence yeah and unfortunately, that's usually a file. Exactly. Unless you get real fancy and start putting it in the firmware. But Well, uh, my whole thing, too, is <laughs> when you put malware even in the memory of a system and you're conducting operations, that could be logged to a file. So mm -hmm. it's not really fileless. But yeah. Uh, yeah, we'll delve into that more. Uh, Office 365 uh, is the number one use case for a CASB right now, according to this article, which uh, I agree, largely... And I don't know why Microsoft hasn't built this in directly, but users of Office 365, which is where Microsoft is pushing everyone. Yeah, I use it. Yeah, it, it's because great. if you're an enterprise and you have Exchange or and or you have Office, your upgrade path is to Office 365. Mm -hmm. So like everyone is heading in that direction, whether you like it or not. If you want new software, you're going to Software as a Service, Office 365 in the cloud. Um, and users can share now in Office 365. It's no longer, well, I have a Word document. I'm going to share it with you, and I'm going to email it to you. It's I can invite users by email. I can send you a link. I can configure the sharing policy and make that document public, very similar to Google Docs. Yep. Um, CASB is now like Sky High and, and others. Wiretap is another one. <clears throat> Basically, entire security suites or portions of their suite are revolving around managing that sharing within Office 365. And that's an entirely new emerging market. I'm not sure why Google has made some efforts to build some of that into Google Docs. Yeah. But in the Microsoft side, they're kind of, they're missing the boat. There could be maybe another acquisition by Microsoft would be my prediction mm. to help people manage that problem. Again, they probably built it out and sold it first <laughs> mm -hmm. for securing it. Yep. Yeah, pretty much that's what happened. <clears throat> This is an interesting article. It only takes one compromised account or vulnerability to cause a data breach. Oh, absolutely. So they say in a corporate setting, one password, uh, particularly if it belongs to a privileged user, to start an attack sequence that can lead to capture thousands or even millions of user accounts. Now, what's interesting is I don't think your strategy should, should be we're never going to have an account that becomes compromised because that's just not. Yeah. Go back to my example of 100,000 users. Like, or you have 100,000 nodes and 50,000 users or whatever, there's always going to be one. And you can't have a security strategy or architecture that is built on the premise that we're going to secure every single user in every single account. You have to build it with the notion that, okay, what happens if one of our accounts are compromised? Yeah, again, it comes back to the human perspective of, you know, we, we trust these people. These are our coworkers. Mm. These are people we see every day. Why would Joe in finance want to harm the business? Why would Mary in accounting want to hurt the business and hurt us? You know, from a human perspective, of course they wouldn't. Right. But that doesn't take into account the fact that technology doesn't care. Yeah, technology has no, right. Technology has no moral compass, unfortunately. Mm hmm yeah, so, I mean, uh, end-user behavior <laughs> analytics, I think, is a great monitoring tool. Uh, mm. Certainly, I think your security architecture needs to just basically 
and we've done this for years in penetration testing, right? We've said, okay, let's just say a user becomes compromised. How far can we get? Yeah. How quickly are we detected, if at all? And um, it, where are we detected and where are we not detected, right? Those can be a couple of different things, right? I mean, it's what John Strand does all the time. He does his password spraying. And, and, and it works. John and I developed that strategy for Black Hills Information Security a long time ago. We said, look, take this concept of the, like external penetration test. Don't throw it out the window. But in large part, organizations that exist today, like don't start with the external test. In fact, most organizations like don't even go there till you're at a certain point. Most organizations, I firmly believe, really aren't at that point. No. Give us an endpoint. Say we've already compromised a user because it's going to happen. Yeah. How far can we get? And not just how far can we get, but really testing those defenses on the inside and saying, okay, mm. you know, if I do this technique, am I detected and how quickly? Okay, let me switch to a different technique. How qu- and creating that map of here's where you were good in your detection yeah. and here's where you were poor, right? And really securing the network from the inside out is what, the, yeah. the strategy we recommended, and I think that somewhat is what the article missed uh, in terms of enterprise defense. So I think those were all the stories that I had. Officers, blah, 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 blah. Um, really not much in the way of product announcements this week, <clears throat> which is normally what we uh, tend to focus on. Not too much. I think people are, are in kind of the quiet mode for Black Hat. Uh, to be honest with you, I think they have a lot of their new software releases ready for Black Hat at this point, and they're not announcing anything new until we get to Black Hat. And I've se- I, you see this trend. Yeah, that makes sense. Pre RSA, pre Black Hat, there was kind of a lull about a month before um, we head to those major conferences. So it's kind of funny. My girlfriend works at a security company now, too. <coughs> yeah. And um, her boss is actually telling her, you need to take vacation the next two months. So the yeah. point is, most businesses right now, they're kind of in the lull. Yeah. You know, everyone's going on vacation, taking their time off. So. And that is also playing into it as well. Yeah. So, all right. With that, we're going to take a short break. Come back. Talk about Docker security in the enterprise or lack thereof. So stay tuned. <laughs> Don't go anywhere. 